Hey there, everybody. My name is Liz. I work with One One Software, and many of you may recognize me from webinars and training videos that you've probably watched on the On One Software website. What many of you don't know is that on the side, I also do photography and retouching as much as I possibly can fit into my schedule. One of the things that I love the most about photography is the ability to shoot both digital and film. I've always had a passion for film. I've always had film cameras since I stole my father's camera when I was probably 12 or 13. One of my first cameras that I actually owned was a 35mm, and my most prized possession is my 4x5 inch film field camera. So I absolutely love film. However, one of the most frustrating things that I've come into is that while it's easy to process the film, it's very hard to print it in the darkroom these days. There are still many places around the country where you can print in the darkroom both color and black and white, but it's an extremely expensive and still very toxic process. So I've come up with a lot of different ways that I can process my photos to make it look like they were processed through a darkroom. Now one of my favorite techniques is a faded style of film processing that's based off of when you used to print on matte paper in the darkroom. Matte paper has a low reflectivity rate, which means that when you hold it up to the light, unlike glossy paper, when you move it around, it's not gonna reflect the light on the paper itself. When you do that with glossy paper, you're gonna get a big glare on the paper itself. Now what's great about matte paper is not only did it have a really cool faded look but it also hid things like imperfections. It softened the image entirely. Unlike glossy paper, which made your files look sharper, matte paper actually made your images look just a little bit hazier. If you go on any photo editing apps, if you go onto any websites that produce things like presets for programs like Lightroom or Aperture, if you've ever seen actions from some of your favorite companies for Photoshop online, they all have faded film presets. It's an extremely popular process these days, and there are lots of different ways that you can recreate it. It's one of my favorite styles for my images, and so I have many different faded film presets that I use on a pretty regular basis. So I wanna show you a couple of cool tips and tricks that I've learned for processing your images to achieve this style. So let's go ahead and jump into the photo suite, and we're gonna start working on this image right here. Now I have two different photos that I'm going to be working on. This is going to be the first one, and then I have the second one open right here. I want to eventually create two files that look very, very similar, that have the same effects on them that I can give to the couple that I shot these photos for as a diptych. So I've got these two different portraits, and I want to process both of them in a very similar way. Now the first thing that we need to do is jump into Perfect Enhance. Now I'm using the program today as a standalone, which means I opened these images from Perfect Browse here into Perfect Layers. And as a standalone, I can jump from application to application. So starting out in Perfect Enhance, I'll just go up to the top right-hand corner of my screen, click on Enhance, and it will transfer this image over into that program. Now, Enhance is a great starting point for your images. On the right-hand side of the screen, we're gonna make some basic adjustments in the color and tone adjustments pane. The first thing I need to do is change the temperature. I want to warm the entire image up. I want to create kind of a soft orangey yellow glow over the entire image. So I'm just going to take the temperature slider and move it to the right. It's okay if it's a little overboard for now. Things will get toned down a little bit later. I also want to make sure that I recover any dark shadows or any bright highlights that I have. So up at the top of my screen in the color and tone adjustments pane, I'm going to push the highlights and the shadow slider quite a bit to the right to make sure that I've got all of the information I could possibly access here. The last really good rule of thumb for working here in Enhance is to adjust your overall brightness. So if I know that I want to lighten or darken my image overall, I'm just going to take the brightness slider and move it one way or the other. Now once these basic adjustments are done, I want to save this as a preset. It doesn't seem like a lot, we just changed the brightness, the shadow and highlight recovery sliders, and the temperature, but this is something we're going to want to apply to the other photo that I'm going to process later. So up at the top of my screen, I'm going to open up the preset drop-down menu and choose Save Preset. We're going to give it a simple name, so we'll call it Basic Warming Preset. I have a category called Liz's Enhanced Presets, which I'll go ahead and select, and then I'll go ahead and click Create. Now we're not going to do anything with that preset right now, we're going to leave it the way that it is. 
And one of the reasons why I like to start out here in Perfect Enhance instead of going straight into Perfect Effects is the fact that I also have retouching tools here. So if you do have portraits that you need to do some very simple retouching to, this is a great place to do that. We have both the Retouch Brush and the Perfect Eraser here in Enhance, and I can use both of those on an image if I need to. Now, this subject has really, really good skin, so there isn't a lot that I actually need to go through and remove. So for now, I'm just going to go ahead and jump over to effects. Now, the great part about using the program as a standalone is that I'm not worried about the fact that I need to go back and forth between multiple applications. So up in the top right hand corner, I'm just going to click on effects. It's going to process all the changes that I made here in Enhance, and then it's going to bring me into effects. Now once inside Perfect Effects, on the left hand side of the screen I have the presets library open. And right up at the top I have a category called Liz's Faded Presets. And I wanted to open this up just so that I could show you some of the styles that I'm interested in recreating today. So this is the look that we're going to be going for, that kind of soft, almost charcoal gray shadow look that you can get, and then that soft, hazy highlight look. Now I have many different faded film presets. These are ones that I use all the time. They're extremely popular with clients that I've worked with. They absolutely love this look. And a lot of the photos that I see in programs like Instagram, where I'm processing and looking at so many different photos, this faded look is everywhere. So that's what we're going to be reproducing here in effects. Now the first thing we need to do is jump over to the Filter Options pane on the right hand side, open up the Filter drop down menu, and we're going to choose the Tone Enhancer. Now the basics of the Tone Enhancer are great. You'll recognize some of these changes like brightness, contrast, shadow and highlight recovery. There's a Levels section that automatically applies a Levels Adjustment, which I'm going to go ahead and click to turn off. We've got the ability to add detail and clarity. However, what we're going to be doing is down at the bottom with this graph. This graph is a representation of the shadows, midtones, and highlights in your image. And you can see there's a visual representation of that with these little gradients that you see on the bottom and the left hand side of the graph itself. So down here on the bottom left will be where your shadows are. And then as you follow it up, we're going to hit the midtones in the center of the graph. And then all the way up to the top right will be your highlights. Now what we need to do is fade out our shadows and our highlights. So the first thing we'll do is there's a little dot on the bottom left hand corner of the graph. I'm going to click and drag that dot up. And as you can see, as I move it away from the dark shadows on the bottom corner, as I move it up, those shadows are getting lighter. Now it looks a little bit like we just took the shadow recovery slider and moved it over quite a bit. And that's not what we're going for. Again, we want to create that faded look. So as I hover my mouse over the line in the graph, you're going to see a crosshair appear. This little crosshair indicates that I can add another dot to my line. So I'm going to click once to add a dot. And if I move this dot up, it's going to lighten the image. And if I move it down to the bottom, it's going to darken the image. And as I do so, you're going to see that now, instead of that weird shadow recovery on overload look that we originally started out with, now we're getting that cool faded shadow look. This is going to be the main difference between an image that looks really, really bad and an image that actually has that cool soft style to it, is that one single dot that we adjusted here in the curves or the graph representation of our tones. Now up on the top right hand corner, we're also going to do the exact same thing to the highlights. I'm just going to click, and we're going to drag this down, we're going to fade out the highlights. We're not going to do it that much. The highlights I've noticed, I fade a very, very small amount. And then just like before, we're going to click to add another dot, and we're going to lift it up. Now the curves itself looks a little strange, but this is a really, really good starting point. If you need to fade out your shadows even more, you can click and drag these dots just a little bit to play around with them. And you can move these around to really make sure that you're getting the look that you want. Sometimes I have to go through and click and drag these dots around a couple of times to make sure that I'm getting what I want. Now back up in the Tone section here, this is also a really good time to adjust your overall brightness again. 
If the image now looks a little too dark or a little too light, taking this brightness slider, as I move it to the right, none of the whites are going to be solid white. They're actually going to be a softer light gray. So because we adjusted the curves down at the bottom of the tone enhancer pane, the brightness slider is now not going to over lighten or over darken your image. So even though my brightness has moved almost all the way over to the right, we're still not getting blown out highlights. We're getting that soft, hazy gray. And that'll be the same if we move it over to the left. We're not going to get any solid blacks. We're just going to get that dark charcoal gray, which is really, really nice. So you can play around here. I'm going to end up lightening my image quite a bit. And there we go. Now everything else here we're going to go ahead and leave alone. And then up in the filter stack, I'm going to click the plus button. Now, We've already created the fade to our photo, which is great. Now I want to add a little bit more of a fade and a color style that can be added on top. So in the filter options pane, back down at that filter drop down menu, I'm going to scroll up and choose something called split tone. This filter splits your image into highlights and shadows and applies a different color to both the highlights and the shadows themselves. It'll automatically apply the blue-orange preset, which means that an orange color is being applied to the highlights and a blue color is being applied to the shadows. And we're going to eventually end up changing that. So the first thing we need to do is down at the bottom, and it's called the Mode drop-down menu. This is how those colors are adjusting and blending with your photo. Right now it's set to color, which means that it's only applying these colors as just colors. Now it sounds a little strange, but what it's doing is it's not taking into account the tone of the colors themselves or the value of the colors. What we want to do is swap this away from color. We want to choose an option called normal. And what that means is it's going to take both the color and the value of the color that we choose for our highlights and our shadows and blend it into our photo. Now once we've done that and we've adjusted our mode, then we want to change the colors. So first we'll select a new highlight color just by clicking inside that swatch. The select color, color dialog box is going to pop up. And I want to choose kind of a butter yellow for my highlights. So I'm just going to take my hue slider here. And we're going to move that over to the right until we get a nice, nice yellow. We're going to take our saturation slider here and move that to the left because we want to desaturate the color. We don't want it to be too strong on our image. And then we're going to make sure our brightness is all the way up at 100. We want our color to be nice and bright. And once we're done here and we click OK, we're also going to do the exact same thing to the shadows. We're going to click on that color swatch and we're going to open up and choose a new color. Now when it comes to working with split tones, there's a very good rule of thumb working with complementary colors. If you're going to be creating a split tone that has a reddish pink for a highlight, then the complementary color would be a greenish tone. So working on an olive green or even a teal green would be a good way to start out and play around with your split tone colors. For a orangey yellow highlight color, we'll want to go towards a slate blue to a light kind of periwinkle purple. So anytime that you're working on a split tone, the best place to start is with complementary colors. So open up a color wheel, take a look and see what's going to work best. Now I'm going to go up and I'm going to choose a blue that's a little bit more purple than this one. And then I'm going to desaturate it just a little bit and I'm going to darken it a little bit. And once I'm done, I'm going to click OK. Now, we're not seeing too much of a difference on our image yet. And one of the reasons why is because our amount sliders, or the intensity of the colors we're adding, are pretty low at this point. So I'm going to take both of these and move them over to the right quite a bit. And as I do so, you're going to see a big change on our photo. Now, the really cool thing about the way that the split tone filter works is that if I decide, let's say, that I don't particularly like my highlight color, I'm going to click inside that color swatch again, and I want to play around with how warm, so how orangey, or how cool my yellow is. If I move my hue slider to the right to make it more green, 
or to the left to make it more red, I'm getting a live preview of what that color is doing to my image, so I don't ever have to guesstimate. I can really rotate this around until I find the color that I'm interested in. And that's one of my favorite parts about working with the split tone filter, is I can get very, very specific here. I'm gonna go ahead and click OK one more time. And I'm gonna click on the shadow color, and we're gonna make it just a little bit darker, and we're gonna saturate it even more. And we'll go ahead and click OK. Now the last thing here that's really important is the balance slider. And this is how intense the highlight color is or how intense the shadow color is. You can rebalance it so that it's heavier on the shadows or heavier on the highlights. So if I move the balance slider to the left, the image is going to get darker and bluer. And if I move it to the right, the photo is going to get lighter and warmer. So this can also be a good way, again, to lighten or darken your image or to weight which color you prefer. So I'm going to move it to the left a little bit to make my photo just a bit more blue. Now the last thing that I want to do, we're going to jump up to the filter stack and click the plus button one more time, is I want to add a soft kind of haze. Now we added the fade, that's what we started out with, with the tone enhancer and the split tone. So we got our fade done, and then with the help of the split tone we also added some cool color stylings, but we want that soft haziness to the image itself. Now, we can add a glow, that's what a lot of people would do, but the glow is not typically my first response, not anymore anyways. So actually to go down, we're going to open up the filter options pane, and I'm going to choose something called our dynamic contrast filter. Now many of you have probably used dynamic contrast before, and most of the time when you apply it to an image it's going to look like this. We're going to get a higher contrast around the edges in our photo, everything is going to look a little bit more detailed, but what many people don't know what the dynamic contrast filter can do is the opposite. It can add a soft haziness, like we were just talking about, to the image itself. In the detail section, the automatic preset is to apply detail to the large and medium areas in your image. What we want to do is remove the detail. So just by taking the large slider and moving it to the left, we're getting softer edges around all of our photo. We're going to do the same thing for the medium slider and the detail slider, and as we move it over, we're getting this softer look on our image. Now we're not going to go too far, because if we go overboard, we're going to get it too soft and too hazy, and that's definitely too much. So be very careful with how much you move these over. I really, really like to keep them above, I would say, negative 20. That's usually as far as I've gotten. If I get too far, they get too hazy. So we're just moving those over a little bit to the left. And now we definitely have that softer matte look. Before we exit Perfect Effects, I need to save this as a preset, just like we did in Perfect Enhance. So we'll go up to my preset drop-down menu. We'll choose Save Preset. I'll go ahead and give it a name. We'll call this number one film look. You can give it any name that you want. I'm going for something really basic that I know I'm going to remember. So we'll call it number one faded film look. I'll place it in my Liz's faded presets category here. I have many different categories, but that's the one that I'm going to pop it in for now. And then I'll go ahead and click create. Now the last thing that we're going to do on this image is resize it really quickly. Up in the top right hand corner, we're going to click on Perfect Resize. It's going to add all of the effects that we applied here in Perfect Effects. It's going to export me, and then it's going to bring me into Resize where I'm going to upsize my photo really quickly. Now once here, on the right hand side, we're going to start it in the Document Size pane. You'll see that the image itself is 16 by 24. That's a pretty decent size. However, let's say that they wanted to print their images out even larger. Not by much, but just by a little bit. So let's say they want the height of their images to be 30 or 35 or somewhere along those lines. Now, as the photographer and the printer, I'm going to have to make sure that I can fit it into a typical print size, but I've got a decently sized large format printer that I have access to, so I'm not too worried about that. I could go pretty big. So in the document size pane, all I need to do is just type in a new width or height. Now you want to make sure that constrained proportions down here is checked because if you don't, your image is going to get stretched and funky. So we're going to type in, let's actually type in a new width. We'll type in 20. And as I do so, we upsized our image and now it's going to be 20 by 30. Very, very easy. I'm going to keep my resolution at 240 
because that's really, really, really important for larger format printing. And then I'm going to scroll down and we're going to apply just a little bit of sharpening. Now right now the sharpening pane is on. You can see it on the right hand side. And the type has been set to progressive sharpening. That's one of my favorites for very basic, very simple sharpening. And all we're going to do is counteract the softness that can happen when you print the images out. Even though we did kind of add that haze and perfect effects, I do still want to make sure that the details in here are going to be crisp enough that you can see them. We don't want to get too much of a haze. So adding just a tiny bit of sharpening will help counteract some of the things that can happen when you print your images out. So with the progressive sharpener, I'm just going to move this over a little bit, probably under 20, a very, very small amount, and then I'm done. Now before we exit, just like we've done in all the other programs, I'm going to save this as a preset. We'll call this Liz's 20 by 30 preset, and I'll place it in Liz's print presets category and click create. Now that I'm done, on the bottom right hand corner, I'm going to click apply. It's going to go through and it's going to add all of the changes that we made in enhance. It's going to apply all the changes that we made in Perfect Effects, and now it's going to apply all the changes that we made in Perfect Resize. It'll bring me back into Perfect Layers, and then I can save my image, and I'm good to go. Now back here in Perfect Browse, you'll see that I have my original file, and it's right next to my new final finished copied version. I have my second portrait here that I need to go through and apply all of the exact same changes to. Now I could go through program to program to program again, but this is one of the reasons why Perfect Batch is such a great tool. So all I need to do is click on my image, go up to the file menu, and scroll down to batch. From here, I need to go through and first jump up to the sources pane and make sure my source is selected items. That's the photo I selected in Perfect Browse. Then I need to click to add a module. You'll see Perfect Effects and Perfect Resize are both here. However, I don't have Perfect Enhance, and that's where we started with our image. So I'm going to click to add a module at the top and choose Perfect Enhance. Now we'll start out here in the Perfect Enhance section. The type is User Presets, Liz's Enhance Presets, and then there's the one that we started out creating, Basic Warming Preset. I'm going to scroll down to the Perfect Effects section. If this wasn't automatically there, you can click to add another module just by opening up this drop-down menu again. Now, we've got our presets set as the type, our Liz's faded presets as our category, and then underneath the preset drop-down menu, we're going to scroll and select number one film look. And then last, here inside perfect resize, we're going to select our user presets, Liz's print presets, We'll open up the preset drop-down menu, and there is Liz's 20 by 30 preset. And the last thing we need to do is select where our new file is going to end up. I recommend saving to your current location, which is where your photo resides at that moment, and making sure that you select Prevent Overwrite from the existing files drop-down menu. You can go here and select your file type, which I'll leave at Photoshop. I'm going to set my color space at Adobe RGB 1998 so I can prep my photo for print. And then down at the bottom, I can rename my file. Now I'm going to do something very basic. I'm going to keep it at the current name, which you can see. And then I'm going to add a serial number at the end. Then I won't lose my file because it will be the exact same name with a number at the end of it. So that's just going to save me a little bit of a headache so I don't have to worry about trying to find it later. And once I'm done in batch, I'll go ahead and click OK. It's going to process my file and then I'll be able to see my before and after here in Browse. Now once it's gone through and it's processed my image, it's going to let me know that there weren't any errors. And then when I go ahead and click Close, I'll be able to see both of my before images here, as well as both of my now matching after images. They have the exact same faded look on both of them. They've both been resized all the way up to 20 by 30. And I don't need to worry about constantly going back and forth between multiple different programs to reapply multiple presets. That's one of the plus sides of Perfect Batch. So as you can see, there's some really cool things you can do inside the Perfect Photo Suite. It's a great tool to use as a standalone because you can get this multi-module workflow. And it's extremely easy to access Perfect Batch so that you can process your files a little bit quicker than having to do everything manually. 
So thanks, you guys, for watching this perfect inspiration today. I always love doing this kind of stuff. And hopefully I will see some of you watchers in my future webinars. Thanks for coming.